Hello and welcome to round 12 of Pro Tour Khans of Tarkir. I'm Tim Willoughby here with Zach Hill and we've got a great round of feature matches for you. Uh, in, on our main table, we've got the Master of Control, on Andrew Cunio up against Raphael Levy of France, Levy playing Mardu Planeswalkers. The other matches we've got going on, uh, Andre Strasky trying to defend his King of the Hill table against former King of the Hill and former Player of the Year, Yuya Watanabe. Uh, Felipe Tapia Berese against um, Tiago Saparito. And on the back table, former Pro Tour winner, Sean McLaren with Jess Guy Agro up against uh, Li Shi Tian also with also with Jess Guy, but already things kicking off here in the control matchup. Zach Hill, it looks like we've got a turn one thought seize there from Andrew Cunio. Yeah, that thought seize revealing from Levy's hand. Not a whole lot of action. Chained to the rocks, utter, and not really good against a blue black control deck that has very very few targets for those cards. And hostility is relevant because it can deal with Prognostic Sphinx, Elspeth Sun's champion. Of course, the big card here. The question is whether you take that with thought sees when you're holding dissolve like cuneo is my inclination is you take something like utter end that can deal with a planeswalker but uh, it looks like he's taking elspeth and saying look i, I don't want to have to worry about having a counter spell for that when it comes time yeah i guess that one of the things that cuneo is thinking about is actually how much does he know about raf levy's main deck if he knows that the mardu planeswalkers deck basically doesn't have that many threats in game one then getting rid of that planeswalker early is a really great play because it means that he knows that he's got one less thing to actually have to deal with yeah, I think that's true. It's also relevant that he, uh, oh, until he drew the Temple of Deceit, he didn't actually have two blue sources for Dissolve. Of course, you obviously think you're going to get there by turn six, but why take chances when your opponent you know, only has a few relevant cards and, and doesn't have a handful of action whatsoever? So Raph Levy there, using the Involving Wilds to fix his mana just a little bit, not just the fetch lands that are in Khans of Tarkir, helping you get the right basic lands when you need to. Um, and they're drawing Sarkhan the Dragon Speaker. So that another Planeswalker from this uh, Mardu Planeswalker's deck, and one that's made a fairly big impact on standard. Yes, yeah, Sarkhan, uh, really one of the premier cards of the set, can both eliminate a very sizable threat and turn into a threat itself as a 4-4 four, four haste, indestructible, not going to get hit with a card like Murderous Cut. I'm, I'm admiring an innovation in Levy deck. I like the synergy there between Chained chain to the Rocks and Evolving Wilds. That plus access to Bloodstained Mire means that it's very easy to both fix your mana and have a mountain. And, and what that gives you access to is a way to remove any creature in the game for a single white mana. Well-designed interaction. Although, of course, not so good against the likes of Sarkhan the Dragon Speaker in another matchup because that is only a creature when you're on your opponent's turn when they're attacking with it, and that's not the time you can hit it with Chain to the Rocks. <laughs> That's exactly right. So both players holding cards that are just not doing a whole lot right now. Chain to the Rocks, Utter and in Hostilities, not too many targets. Bile Blight from Cuneo, also not going to do a whole lot against that Sark and the Dragon Speaker. I think what's happening right now is that both players just want to continue to be able to play lands. And uh, if I'm looking at Levy's hand right, he, he, he doesn't necessarily have... Oh, he's got a Bloodstained Mire. He was trying to decide whether he wanted to use Mardu Charm just to make two 1-1 one -one tokens there. I mean, it's something that we talk about a lot in Control Mirrors. This is not perhaps a traditional one, because on Raph Levy's side of the board, he's not got counter spells, he's just got a lot of board control. But hitting your land drops, super duper important. And one thing that Andrew Cunio has going for him is things like Radiant Fountain. Uh, he has got a way of offsetting some of the life that he loses from fetch lands, that he loses from thought seeds, that he loses from attacks. And with the Pearl Lake Ancient in his hand, he can actually set up something kind of cool where against aggro, sometimes he uses Pearl Lake Ancient to help him bounce his own lands, replay that Radiant Fountain, and just keep his life total just a little bit higher. Yeah, you can also return the Temple of Deceit and be able to control the top of your library a little bit more than you ordinarily would be. So yeah, Pearl Lake Ancient are doing some work that you may not uh, have ordinarily anticipated. So you're playing the, the dress. So yeah, Mardu Charm there, getting a chance for Rafa Levy to have a look at Andrew Cuneo's hand, awesome. and target opponent reveals their hand, you choose a non-creature, non-land card from it, and they have to discard that card. Now basically, almost all of Andrew Cuneo's deck is live for, for the charm. Um, yes, the Pearl Lake Ancient can't get hit, the lands can't, but any of the, the business spells are perfectly reasonable targets for that charm. And that's basically exactly what you want to happen there if you're Levy. I mean, end step at instant speed, being able to get Dissolve out, that clears the way for Sarkin, and that means that Levy is going to be able to get in at least one attack. And that, this is the power of haste, I suppose, really, that um, okay. because Sarkin immediately gets to attack, even if Andrew Cunio finds a way of dealing with it, he's already taken that hit. 
Yeah, and we see the Perilous Vault in Cuneo's hand, but that's going to take at least two turns to answer Sarkin. So Levy able to provide some really powerful pressure there. I, I mean, that just shows the power of Mardu Charm and the ability to cast Discard at instant speed, which is not something that we see very often, precisely because of how powerful it can be when done on the draw step or the in step like that. And a really strong draw here from the Hall of Famer, Raphael Levy. He's found uh, Chandra Pyromaster, so another Planeswalker, so that basically he can say, fine, yes, I acknowledge that you're going to be able to deal with Sarkhan fairly soon, thanks to that Perilous Vault, but I've got follow-ups. And, and exactly, uh, Levy has access to Utter End, which is able to take out any permanent, including an artifact. So he was actually able to deal with that Perilous Vault and that Sarkhan all of a sudden representing pretty tremendous threat for Cuneo. Cuneo has access to Pearl Link Ancient now with seven mana, but Pearl Link Ancient doesn't have flying. It's not going to be able to block Sarkin, and uh, Levy also has the option to ultimate Sarkin here if he so chooses. Well, that was going to be my next question for you, actually, Zach Hill. I was wondering, what circumstances do you actually ultimate Sarkin in? Because it's so compelling, the idea of just attacking with a hasty, indestructible dragon every single turn building up loyalty, making that Planeswalker a bit harder to deal with, killing your opponent, when is it right to just say, I'm going to draw an awful lot of cards? I mean, I think that uh, you're going to end up ultimating that card quite a bit. Um, I think right now, when Cuneo hasn't demonstrated an ability to be able to deal with it really at all, that now is not the time. I mean, you've seen that Perilous Vault is you know, the way that the deck sort of intends to be able to deal with Planeswalkers, that and counter magic. So I don't think this is the time to get your Planeswalker off the board. On the other hand, if you think that your opponent has a lot of ways to deal with it, if it's post-sideboard and your opponent has access, I mean, I don't know, even to a card like Phyrexian Revoker, or, or just when your opponent isn't at 12 life and your four damage a turn is not likely to end the game soon, I think that's when you're going to say, okay, I'm going to draw three cards a turn, but it, it looks like Levy thinks the time to do that's right now. I draw three cards a turn. He also has that Chandra as a follow-up and uh, cards like End Hostilities and Chain to the Rocks that are not really very excellent against Cuneo's board and, and, and this style of deck. So I think he, maybe he's saying, okay, I don't mind discarding any of these blank cards. I'm going to draw three a turn. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I mean, this Mardu Planeswalkers is a control deck after a fashion. It has an awful lot of cards that are able to impact the board and deal with opposing threats. But in point of fact, he just wants to find the ones that are actually going to end the game here, because this is a slightly unusual matchup, really. I mean, yeah. One of the cards that could end the game is Sarkin, though. And, uh, I mean, we've already seen that Cuneo didn't really have a great answer to it. So, I, I mean, my temptation would maybe be to just keep trying to hit for four in the air. I mean... On the other end, Levy knows about Bile Blight from Cuneo, so that means that it could buy him essentially a turn of Sarkin attacks. That means two more cards that Levy would have drawn. So I guess he's thinking, eh, you know, I'm, I'm going to draw so many cards that the extra four damage just doesn't really matter that much. I mean, one thing that the Pearl Lake Engine can do is it can just kill off Chandra. Right. So now Levy is living off the top of his deck. Now, admittedly, he's living off the top three cards of his deck, but he's not able to sort of craft a plan over a number of turns, because every turn he's discarding his hand at the end of each turn. Yeah, he's definitely got to just kind of cast his hand as it goes. I mean, the, the other thing that I didn't think about is that Lemmy knows about the Pearl Lake Ancient. Pearl Lake Ancient could just attack Sarkin and kill it. I, I'm used to thinking of Sarkin as a 4-4 flyer, forgetting about the fact that it's not quite that. It's still a planeswalker with loyalty on your opponent's turn. So it, it would just get eaten by the Ancient. So by making an emblem, that allows you to essentially have access to a resource that Cuneo can't threaten with Pearl Lake Ancient. Also, because Ancient would be able to return that Radiant Fountain, that means that Sarkin's clock of four damage a turn, not as threatening uh, as you'd ordinarily think against an opponent with just 12 points of life. Now, there is a Crackling Doom in Raf Levy's hand, but that's unlikely to be able to deal with Pearl Lake Ancient because you can always return three lands to your hand to bounce the, uh, the big creature there. Yeah, you definitely can bounce it. You can float mana with those lands and recast Ancient. Crackling Doom still deals two damage to your opponent and you know allows you to force him to return three lands to his hand, which means that if you draw another removal spell, it won't be able to recast the Ancient. So, I mean, I still think you cast Crackling Doom and Chandra here and you know deal your opponent three damage and essentially gain yourself uh, six life while returning three of your opponent's lands to his hand. 
Now, thinking of what we've seen of blueback control in the feature match area so far, it's not necessarily had the most auspicious of performances. A number of times, I mean, we've seen other players on Andrew Cuneo's team not quite able to convert the wins in the feature match area, though still clearly doing very well. If you're looking to learn about blueback control, though, this is the person to watch, right? Yeah, Andrew Cuneo, known for exactly this style of deck, guys. Magic Online name for a long time was Gainsay, which is kind of the control card against other control decks. So it's definitely the archetype that he likes to play. We saw Levy Cassette first main phase to make Cuneo tap out uh, so that Chandra could get on the board and deal a damage. But yeah, I mean, watching Cuneo play is to watch how to play blue-black control. On the other end, we've definitely seen Stanislav Sivka with this deck in the feature match. He is a phenomenal control player as well. And someone else who's still alive is Adrian Sullivan playing his own take on blue-black control with inevitability. So, I mean, I, I think we're seeing a lot of clinics and control decks. I think when you allude to the challenge of how well those decks are doing, it is just very hard to build a control deck for a format as open as this Pro Tour. Yeah, I know before the Pro Tour, a lot of people were saying they honestly just didn't think there could be a control deck. That doesn't seem to be the case. It's just it's still very difficult to play. And the change to the rocks there making life a little bit difficult for Cuneo in terms of keeping Pearl Lake Ancient around because gradually he's running out of lands here. Yeah, exactly. He currently doesn't have enough to recast Ancient. He had to cast Dissolve on that chain to the rocks. And then we see yet another Chandra here from Levy. So <laughs> Chandra dealing damage, and basically acting like ways of dealing damage and gaining life. Chain to the rocks. Oh, wow, another chain to the rocks from oh, Levy. Oh, sorry, yeah. That is huge. Because Cuneo, I mean, he's going to go down to just three lands and bounce the Ancient, but that Ancient's not getting back on the battlefield for a while. Yeah, Chandra. So Chandra number two, likely to stick around a little bit longer than Chandra number one did. And just a little bit of an update from one of our back tables. Felipe Tapia Bacera currently a game up against um, Tiago Saporito. They're, both those players are nine and two, um, and we'll give you more updates from them as we hear it. But in the meantime, it looks like Andrew Cuneo's control engine rolling. He's found a way of drawing himself some more cards, potentially, in the form of that Jace's ingenuity. And some more updates from other tables. Uh, Li Shi Qian with Jeskai Ascendancy is a game up against uh, Sean McLaren's Jeskai Agro. I mean, Definitely a lot of people wondering exactly how powerful the ultimate on Sarkin was. We were talking about it. It's like, do you use this instead of just attacking? But I mean, the ultimate has allowed Levy to just completely take over this game. Three cards a turn is a lot of cards. And we're seeing, I mean, Chandra is over and over again. We see Elspeth in his hand. I mean, that emblem is doing some work. Yeah, and now that Elspeth's in play, we see start to see the full power of what Raf Levy can do. He's been drawing lots of extra cards and converting them into threats on the board. And with so few lands in play now for Andrew Cuneo, his ability to really deal with them is quite limited. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that perilous vault from uh, Cuneo's side, I, I, honestly, this game, if I had to say it was about anything, it was about that utter end that Levy was able to use on Perilous Vault. Sure. I mean, Vault would just wipe Levy's board right here if it was able to, to sit on the battlefield. But instead, I mean, Levy just flooding the board with Planeswalkers and burying Cuneo in card advantage. Sure. Okay. How many decks are there in the format that can uh, remove an artifact in game one? There can't I, be many, right? I don't really think there are that many. And I guess many. if no, you have I mean, Banishing Light, you might be able to. But it's, it's certainly a, a comparatively unusual thing to see in game one. And it's something that Raph Levy's been able to leverage heavily in this. Right. And Banishing Light, even though it can deal with Vault number one, very awkward against Vault number two. <laughs> yeah. That, of course, removes the Banishing Light and puts Vault right back on your opponent's side of the table. So Raph Levy, even though his deck is, in inverted commas, a creatureless control deck, he's got six soldiers in, to, in play now. He's obviously six been doing a bit of work with Sarkhan earlier on. And with Andrew Cuneo on six life, it could be all over for game one here. Yeah, we see Levy, too, with Lightning Strike in his hand. Uh, Cuneo has Bile Blight, so the question is, is he going to use it to deal with those tokens? It looks like the answer is yes. And <laughs> yeah, we see a atypical play there with a Lightning Strike on Levy's own token which essentially counters the Bile Blight, meaning you can get in for two more points of damage. Yeah, Bile Blight says, uh, 
target creature and all creatures of the same name get minus three, minus three. Now, if you kill the one target, then it doesn't resolve. So all of a sudden, you got, the Bile Blight doesn't get to kill off everything else. So nice play there from Raph Levy. And, I mean, Cuneo right now, he's got Pearl Incantion, he's got Jace's Ingenuity. But there are just not that many yeah, cards too. in the format that can deal with this situation. He need nine total mana to be able to play and activate Vault. That is not what we're looking at right now. It, it looks likely that we're going to see the, the French uh, Hall of Famer here picking up the first game. Um, but we'll, we'll go through the sort of end moments here. Another Bile Blight there successfully dealing with Soldier Tokens. But even with life gained off Radiant Fountain, Andrew Cunio on just three life here, so not a huge amount to work with. We see Crackling Doom plus a Chandra activation. That will spell the end of this game if that Crackling Doom resolves. Raph Levy keen to do things right. He starts off with his Planeswalker activation. Elspeth plus one makes three soldier tokens there in the middle of the board. Yeah, and that looks like what he's going for. <laughs> Chandra on a lot of loyalty right now. It's funny, normally when you think about the ultimate abilities, the final abilities on Planeswalkers, they end games really fast. Sarkhan Ultimate did a long time ago, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it certainly did prove decisive in, in making Raph Levy's oh. draws amazing. It just took a bit longer to finish things off. It looks like Cuneo was at a higher life total than we initially realized because the uh, life totals hadn't been updated yet as a result of that Radiant Fountain, meaning the game uh, not, not quite ending just yet. We see another Dissolve Cuneo just trying to dig and, uh, I mean, trying to do something about the Sarkin emblem, but there are not very many things to do about well, it. Well, there's literally place. nothing you can do about an emblem. Once, it, once it's in play, the only thing you can do is win the game, and next game they don't have it, right? Right, right. win the game against Elspeth with seven loyalty and Chandra with eight. As it is, he might be taking the other option of losing the game and them not having it next turn. But Ether Spouts bought him a little bit of time here, so... A, a v valiant rearguard action from Andrew Cuneo as he tries to find a way of staying in this game. Thought sees getting rid of one of the... No, he's not even going to show his hand. He's going to say, that's enough. Thank you very much, Raph Levy. We're going to move on to game two and go to sideboards and figure out exactly what we want to do here. We'll be back with that other game right after these messages, though. A bigger game by playing in a Grand Prix. These open tournaments feature the best players in your region as well as top Magic pros from around the world. Upcoming Grand Prix include Los Angeles, Stockholm, Nashville, Santiago, New Jersey, and Madrid. Visit wizards.com slash Grand Prix for a complete schedule. You've watched the Pro Tour. How about playing on the Pro Tour? Qualifiers for Pro Tour Favor Forged are going on now around the world, with winners earning an invitation and airfare to Washington, D.C. in February. Visit wizards.com slash ptq for more information. Hello and welcome back to our feature match area. While our control players uh, sideboard for game two over on the front, we're going to take a little look at one of the other tables uh, here in the feature match area for round 12 of Pro Tour Khans of Tarkir. On the left of our screen, we've got Sean McLaren, who's Jeskai Agro. On the right of our screen, uh, Li Shi Qian. He's a game up right now. He is playing the, another kind of Jeskai deck, Jeskai Ascendancy. You'll see that while he has got green mana in play, he's very much about resolving a red, white, and blue spell because when Jeskai Ascendancy comes into play, if you've got some mana producers, all kinds of crazy things happen. We've got aggro, we've got combo, we've got control in our feature match area. What a great standard format. Yeah, I mean, it looks like a kind of format where basically everything is viable, and including combo decks that become aggro decks as we see Savage Knuckleblade crashing into the red zone. Not really what you're expecting game one from a Jeskai Ascendancy combo deck. And this is game two. Uh, Alishi Chan is currently a game up, and it looks like we might have seen a uh, transformational cyborg perhaps from the uh, Chinese Taipei player. Yeah, that's what it looks like, and that is an incredibly powerful strategy. If your opponent's bringing in a bunch of cards like Erase, being able to crash in for six points of damage a turn is able to get in the game really quickly, and your opponent probably not keeping in a lot of ways to remove creatures. Yeah, that Mantis Rider not necessarily racing particularly effectively against a, a Savage Knuckleblade. It can't <laughs> block the 4-4 even without the pump, and then if it tries to attack through. It has got Vigilance. It can attack each turn. It's it's not dealing nearly as much damage. Yeah, you're not going to win the race three versus six. I mean, you really need a different removal spell to deal with Savage Knuckle Blade. The problem with that is a lot of your burn doesn't quite get there. You could stoke the flames if you have access to it, but not once your opponent untaps. Now, one very cool thing about these transformational sideboard plans, as we call them, where you completely change your plan in game two is 
what happens if Sean McLaren wins this game? He then has to decide, in game three, am I playing against this aggro deck or am I playing against a combo deck? What am I supposed to do? Right, and th there's not always a right answer. Like, what if Li Shi Chan just leaves in two Savage Knuckle Blades? Are you going to keep in six creature removal spells to deal with it? What if he doesn't even need to draw it to cast it? So that's one of the flexible parts of being able to sideboard into a different strategy or a separate strategy, is that you get to control what the pace of the game is going to look like. And it sounds like we've got some results from some of the other games as well. So uh, Felipe Tapia Becerra is going to game three against Thiago Saparito. So that one very much in the balance as things go right now on our live look in here with Sean McLaren on the left off screen and Li Shi Qian on the right. Well, Sean is able to throw a lot of burn at Li Shi Qian's face. That was six right there. We've seen a couple of Manus Rider attacks. So even though Knuckleblade by itself very good at racing, the Mantis, uh, with the help from some burn spells, it looks like Sean might have the upper hand. Yeah, and it looks like Sean's got a dissolve in hand there, so he's perhaps trying to um, be the control a little bit against a combo deck. Having to kind of do aggro too is a little bit tricky. Um, not quite sure on what the life totals are here, but they're a retraction helix being played by Li Shi Qian to potentially uh, hold off a little bit of uh, Sean McLaren's attacking, at least for this turn. So Li Shi Chan on just four life, and that we see the reason that McLaren quite happy to fire off a dissolve on re retraction helix. He just needs to get four more points of damage in while he himself is on 12. So this is a race still in favor of the Canadian. And there it is. That's three damage from the Manus Rider and two more for Magma Jet. That represented what? Three, four, six, nine, eleven damage over just the course of a single turn. It really highlights how much damage that Jeskai aggro deck can throw at you. So we got to have a nice live look in there on the back table. Sean McLaren and uh, Li Shi Qian playing there. That match being covered by uh, Ray Walkinshaw, so you're welcome to read it on the text side of the site. But we're back to our main match here. On the left of our screen, that's Andrew Cunio playing a Temple of Deceit, getting a little scry before Raf Levy draws and plays his own Scryland for the turn. And both of these players, after sideboarding, have a lot of ability to change their decks around. I mean, w looking at Levy's side, he had a bunch of copies of Anger of the Gods, Chain of the Rocks, not really made especially for this matchup. Able to stock up on more cards like Thoughtseize and a uh, more diverse array of threats, including Brima's King of Oreskos, which conveniently gets right around that Bile Blight that we saw from Cuneo earlier. So... Uh, the question here, I think, is a question of who can outmaneuver one another to make sure that they've got the right threats for the opponent's wrong answers. On Cuneo's side, he could board in Jora by Merc Lurker. He's got a disdainful dr stroke for some of those Planeswalkers, as well as Thoughtseize. Doesn't matter how good Elspeth is when it's on the battlefield if it gets taken right outside of your hand. And Raf Levy here, we saw some of his stats on the side of things. He's the current uh, leader in overall pro points earned as he casts a tormenting voice, discarding um, one card in order to be able to draw two new ones, sort of digging for exactly what he needs. Tormenting voice, not necessarily one that I would have expected to see a lot out of, but actually a red card drawing spell, they're not exactly, there's not exactly too many of them ever been printed, really. So a nice pickup for the control decks that are not running blue cards. An interesting story about that set, when I was working on Magic 2013, uh, Wild Guess was originally supposed to cost one and a red, uh, but there were so many graveyard synergies in Innistrad that we made it cost red, red just to be safe, and it ended up not really doing a lot in that set, so I think Tormenting Voice was an attempt to say, okay, exactly how much can we push this effect and still have it show up? I think it's probably a fringe constructed card, but it looks to be doing good work here in Levy's deck. And I'm, I'm guessing that Levy was keen to play that out fairly early on because it's a kind of a disaster if your opponent counters one of them because the discarding a card is an additional cost of Tormenting Voice, so you could just get two for one quite easily if that spell can be swapped. Yeah, I think we actually saw that in a limited match. Uh, or in uh, where Cancel was targeting Tormented Voice earlier, and it was really very powerful. Just essentially for one UU dealing with two of your opponent's threats, you could tell the person who cast it wasn't really expecting it to get countered. A uh, quick update from one of our other tables. It looks like Yuya Watanabe is back to being King of the Hill. He had to give up that slot um, earlier on in the weekend, but he is very much crowned again, the two-time uh, Hall of... Uh, two-time... Um, Player of the Year, defeating Andrei Strasky two games to zero. 
So back in familiar territory there, I suppose, for you, Watanabe, as a Maru charm here means that Andrew Cuneo's hand is on display to all of us here. There's Perilous Vault. There's a dissolve in there. Looks like we have a pretty stacked hand, actually, for Andrew Cuneo, all told. A um, couple of copies of Perilous Vault, Dig Through Time, Dissolve, and a couple of lands there. Pretty much everything I control deck wants. It is, yeah. I mean, and I have no idea exactly what you take. I mean, part of me thinks that you just take the, uh, I mean, Jace's ingenuity, but then dig through time is going to get you the card advantage back. You could take Dissolve and just try to force through a threat while you have it. The downside is that uh, Levy's only threat here, Chandra Pyromaster, pretty good, but not as, as kind of game-ending as a card like Sarkin. I think you take the Dissolve here and just try to jam your Chandra and get something onto the battlefield. It's interesting, because if there was one Perilous Vault, I'd have been kind of tempted to take the Vault. But because there's two, you've got that redundancy there. It means that if you're doing that, you're just saying, I'm not really going to get any action going for a while. Yeah, that's exactly right. We see Dig Through Time going to be live uh, at some point in the game, but those Vaults exile themselves. Polluted Delta gets you one. Whatever gets uh, Mardu Charm gets you another card, but still quite a way off from being able to fire off Dig Through Time. Uh, Chase's Ingenuity will hit in just a couple of turns. I'm curious about Levy's hand. It seems like he kept in Lightning Strike, basically just to be able to deal three damage to the face. Not really a whole lot of other targets for that card out of Cuneo's deck. So it looks like the Dissolve was taken there. Um, and Raph Levy now just sort of figuring out what he wants to do next. His, his hand is, is solid, but neither of these decks necessarily looking to win the game super fast. Yeah, I think you've got to prioritize just getting Chandra on the battlefield uh, as soon as you can. I mean, e even if your opponent has Perilous Fall, just play a Chandra, start taking it up, force your opponent to do something. So there is the Vault. Uh, in some respects, safer in play than in um, Andrew Cuneo's hand. Between Madu Charm and Thoughtseize, there's plenty of ways for Levy to deal with things while C Andrew Cuneo is still holding on to them. Somewhat fewer, at least in terms of artifacts, once they're in play. Yeah, we saw last uh, last game, it was Utter End into Sarkin that defined the pace of that game. Levy plays one copy of Utter End and one main deck copy of Sarkin, the Dragon Speakers. So definitely they did some work last game. He's got another copy of Sarkin that he can bring in. But yeah, I, th I think you've just got to cast this Chandra and start taking it up. And so there we have it. The, the plus one ability on Chandra effectively just dealing one point of damage to Andrew Cuneo and not a great deal more, but just building up the loyalty and dealing damage where you can. And then at some point when you've got more lands in play saying, I'm going to use the zero ability in order to sure. kind of draw a few extra cards. Speaking of drawing cards, we saw Levy thinking for a long time when he cast that Chandra. I think one of the reasons was he could would have been able to thought seize Cuneo's Jace's ingenuity, which really would start fighting the card advantage war. Uh, Right now we see Banishing Light kind of asking Cuneo to uh, blow up Perilous Vault in response. That allows Levy to cast Thought Seize on Jace's Ingenuity, which he could then take and then, uh, you know, potentially hit the Dig Through Time with the Mardu Charm that he just drew. Question, I mean, you could also take Dig Through Time and try and hit Jace's Ingenuity later, but it looks like he's opting into be two for wanting himself essentially to uh, be able to cast thought seize. Yeah. Oh, oh no, 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 sorry. My, my fault. That banishing light was revealed off Chandra. Yeah. It was not cast. I thought he was casting it as sort of a test spell. Sure. So here right. comes the thought seize. And Andrew Cunha, he's already figured out he knows what he's going to do with this, which is put his hand in for everyone to see there. So that there, perilous vault and the banish, the uh, dig through time, Jace's ingenuity. And that disdainful stroke and just says, take what you want to take. You see there, he's not necessarily looking super comfortable in his position in this game. Um, it's, it's one of those things that the reading a control player can sometimes be a little bit difficult because they're the ones that have nothing going on on the board necessarily. It's all going on in terms of their hands. Right. Now his hand is laid bare on the table. The control player definitely not in their com comfort zone. And I, I love taking Dig Through Time there. It's the most powerful card drawing spell that the blue-black deck has access to. You can now just throw Banishing Light out there, essentially trade one for one, not two for one with Perilous Vault. That's really not a bad situation. You got to damage out of Chandra in the process. Have you seen the look on a control player's face when they cast Dig Through Time? <laughs> that, that little moment where you tap two blue to do anything as a control player feels pretty good. And then they deal out seven cards and get to just look at 
pick out the two they want. It's it's something that I'm looking forward to casting an awful lot of copies of Dig Through Time in the next couple of years as standard. It's definitely a moment of sheer glee, especially when uh, you can dig through time into uh, more Jace's ingenuities and digs yeah, through time. Yeah. Absolutely. So here we see Evolving Wilds letting Raph Levy fetch the land that he needs. It looks like that's likely to be a, pl uh, a mountain here, or is it a plains? We'll see I think he's going to want to get a... S oh, he's getting a mountain. Okay, interesting. I was thinking he might want to get a swamp, so it allows him to cast Crackling Doom and Mardu Charm in the same turn, or Thought Seize and Mardu Charm at the same turn, but it looks like he's uh, prioritizing access to red mana. Wow, big draw there, and read the bones. Yeah, read the bones. It's interesting that the... The Mardu deck here might have a similar number of card advantage spells to the blue-black control deck between Read the Bones and, um, and Chandra and a, you know, a whole bunch of options in red, white, and black for drawing cards, which <laughs> is kind of unusual historically. Yeah, Sarkin emblems, for example. Yeah, I mean, Dig Through Time, I think, the premier card drawing spell in the format, but Read the Bones, certainly very powerful card selection. And in terms of card selection, scry lands don't hurt too much either. Yep. Um, don't, certainly don't hurt as much as fetch lands that are more thinning your deck than actually helping you improve your draws too much. Um, whereas with the scry lands, the temples, you do get to say, well, if I don't like the card on top, it can go to the bottom and I'll see if I can do something better. Now that was a huge Jace's ingenuity for Cuneo. Cuneo looking at four more cards this turn. Disdainful Droke, threaten stroke, threatening any Elspeth that might come down. The question is, whether he has access to more counter spells and card drawing to be able to capitalize off that card advantage he just gained. I mean, it's interesting looking at the way the control has evolved over time. In, in the bad old days, the good old days, depending on how you look at it, <laughs> it, it was an awful lot of counter magic and instant speed card drawing that you, you basically play everything at the end of your opponent's turn. Um, Raph Levy's deck is a control deck. Uh, let's be under no illusions here. It's not really, well, it can't counter any spells. And even... Cunio's deck doesn't run as much counter magic as control decks of old. It is a lot more about sort of picking your spots. It has got the instant speed card drawing, but then sort of controlling what's on the board a little bit too. Now, Anger. Levy is able to use that Mardu charm to push through a Chandra. He can play a mountain and cast it. So that means he is able to get a threat on the battlefield. We know that Cuneo has Perilous Fault, but that's going to take a couple of turns to work. Oh, okay, now he, he has the Disdainful Stroke, so Dissolve into Disdainful Stroke costs exactly the five mana that he had available, and uh, that means that Levy is uh, going to need to rely on that Sarkin in order to get a threat on the battlefield. Lightning Strike, Crackling Doom, really not doing a whole lot at this stage of the game. Sure. And we've got another result from one of our other tables. It looks like um, Tiago Saporito has emerged victorious against Felipe Tape Bercera. That match now completed. So just two matches going on, and all of them pretty high pedigree players, because in addition to our video match, it is the deciding game going on on the back table, the text feature match being written up by Ray Walkinshaw. Sean McLaren and Li Shi Qian are currently 1-1 over there. You'll be able to read all about that over on the coverage, the text coverage on our website. It's pretty impressive to think about the composition of Cuneo's deck after sideboard position against Levy's. Levy has a lot of sideboarding options, a lot of discard, but Cuneo has access to three Disdainful Stroke, three Negate, four Heroes Downfall, and four Dissolve after sideboarding. I mean, that means that he just has a lot of ways to stop Planeswalkers, in addition, of course, to his Perilous Vault. So, I mean, it's very, very challenging for Levy to both resolve and stick a threat when Cuneo is able to efficiently answer basically his entire deck with a series of two mana counter spells. Well, I mean, to me, basically, even though it's the sort of the planeswalkers that win the game, that you know, the big creatures that win the game, this is really all a matchup about who can run the other one out of cards fastest. Because that one for one answers that uh, Andrew Cuneo has, as soon as something slips through, it can potentially deal quite a bit of damage. And it's going to be who can leverage what they're doing to sort of draw enough cards to run the other person out of cards to stick a threat. And, and thinking about running out of cards, I mean, it's easy to lose sight of this looking at the hands, but if we think about how this game is played out, Levy is essentially mulligan to five this entire game. Lightning Strike and Crackling Doom have accomplished absolutely nothing with Cuneo at 20 life and no creature-based permanence to throw those cards at. I think Levy is going to need to look back if, if he ends up losing this game after sideboarding and say, are these cards really pulling their weight? I mean, it could be 
an issue of something as simple as there isn't enough to board out of this main deck configuration against blue-black control. But he's just been sitting there with those cards in his hand the entire game, not able to put a, not together a critical mass of threats to get anything on the board. One thing I kind of love about how this game is playing out is look at the speed that both of these players are playing at. It's classic draw-go, drawing, sticking a land into play, saying go, building up uh, cards in hand after the initial flurry of activity. And Raf Levy here, each turn trying out something, but Andrew Cunio at this point, he's drawn his extra cards with Jace's Ingenuity. He's got answers. There we see his second negate, the now dealing with Chandra Pyramaster, and Raf Levy just sort of desperately trying to find a way of getting into this game properly. Now you see Levy holding Elspeth's son's champion in his hand and, and yet he's still willing to play Chandra. That I think is because he can play Chandra and immediately exile the top card of his library and giving him an opportunity to cast something Good. even through Cuneo's Perilous Vault. Elspeth essentially just trades one for one with the Perilous Vault that's on the battlefield. Now with Levy having a pair of lightning strikes and a crackling tube, that is eight damage, not quite Cuneo's 21. Levy's got a big uphill battle to climb, and it looks like he's saying, yeah, it's not worth uh, fighting this out. Yeah, you could see the, the change in Andrew Cuneo's demeanor there just before um, Levy scooped up his cards. He's just sort of bobbing away on the table, looking pretty pleased with himself. He's got a lot of cards in hand. He knows that he can one for one for the rest of the game, and winning at that point is kind of academic. I mean, it is one of the advantages of playing blue in a control deck. We talked a lot about the counter spells, and we, we said that Levy has a little bit of card draw, but it's absolutely nothing like a several, three Jace's Ingenuities and four Dig Through Time. But we're going to get a look in on game three of the match between Sean McLaren and Li Shi Qian. Um, McLaren on the left of our screen there with uh, Jessica Agro. And Shi Li Shi Qian has a deck that is a sometimes combo deck, but by the looks of the Pelucranos in his graveyard, it looks like he's trying to be a little bit more straightforward beatdown. Yeah, last game we saw the beatdown not fast enough to deal with McLaren's flurry of burn spells, but Pelucranos a little bit more resilient than Savage Knuckleblade, uh, also capable of killing one of those Manus Riders should it come to that. Might be that Lee, I mean, we saw him leaving the Banishing Knacks for the second game, so he probably leaves the combo in and uses the aggressive creatures as a support to that. I mean, the life totals at present 17 to 13 in Sean McLaren's favor, so plenty of play left in this game. I don't know how, quite how much we're going to get a chance to see while our control players shuffle up, but it's, it's really interesting to me to see the way that a lot of decks in this format kind of maneuver around one another with sideboarding to potentially become really quite different beasts. Yeah. I'm looking at McLaren just resolving dig through time and thinking about if there's any breakout spell of this tournament, I think it absolutely is dig through time. We've seen it in combo decks, we've seen it in control decks, we see it in this deck as an aggressive uh, you know, deck to just fi draw to that anger of the god. Just a huge play right there. I mean, it's basically allowing McLaren to find exactly what he needs whenever he wants it. I mean, I, I can see for the next couple of years a standard uh, just dig through time fights being some of the defining attributes of the format. It looks like Li Shi Qian not without a bit of fight back himself, though. Savage Knuckleblade there, his next threat after the Anger of the Gods cleared his side of the board. Um, looks like he's going to be able to get a chance to attack in there, but our players on the main table are ready to start their um, game three, so we are going to jump back there as Jeskai Charm deals with Savage Knuckleblade for now. So on the left of our screen, we're going to have Andrew Cunio looking to see whether or not he can continue to work the card advantage machine up against Raphael Levy, and Levy, I'm sure, basically looking to say, early on, I want to get a feel for what's in your hand. I want to get rid of some of that with thought season similar. And I want to try and keep a threat in play for just a little bit, because if I can, then all of a sudden my burn spells feel alive again. Exactly, yeah. And Levy does have access to four thought seas, four Mardu charms, so he can do some damage to Cuneo's hand. I think what he wants to do, and I, of course we haven't quite seen if he even sideboarded these, oh, there they are right there, is get Brimma's King of Oreskos on the table. You can't answer that card with Disdainful Stroke. You can't answer that card with Bile Blight. You can't answer that card with Dissipate on the play. There just really aren't a lot of good ways of dealing with Brimaz beyond just spending two turns activating Perilous Fault. And it sounds like McLaren's sideboard plan was an effective one against uh, Li Shi Qian. In spite of being able to pick up the first game, uh, Li Shi Qian succumbing in three to Sean McLaren. It's all about winning two out of three, not just the first one. And there is that Brimaz, King of Oreskos, exactly what you called there, um, Zach Hill. Now it's in play. The 3-4 that makes extra tokens is 
pretty much the only threat that Rafa Levy needs to have around until Andrew Cuneo finds an answer. And that answer might be a long time coming. Yeah, especially with what's in his hand. Double disdainful stroke dissipate. Very good in the matchup, but not very good against a turn three Brimaz. And uh, right now, Cuneo is on a pretty big clock. I mean, if Levy just sits back, casts yep. Mardu Charm on the end of the turn, uh, you know, even during the draw step, trying to strip Cuneo, you know, if he draw steps the Mardu Charm that prevents Minor. Silence the Believers Minor. from being a possible answer, I don't even know if Cuneo even plays that, but I mean, Hero's downfall is really about the only thing that he can do against Primaz, either that or top deck a Perilous Vault that makes it through Mardu Charm. So we're gonna getting some Cat Soldier tokens on the board. It looks like, in, in principle, we could end up with quite a few of them um, as Raph Levy able to just say, I've got my threats, I know what I'm doing, you can just sort of see if you can get out of this one, and if you do, well, I might have a few more moves. And there's that draw step Mardu charm we see getting hit with a dissipate, allowing Cuneo to scry. That means Cuneo not able to drop a vault this turn, and uh, that just means Brimaz is going to hit for even more damage. And if Cuneo is able to deal with the first one, there's a second Brimaz on the way. And, and, and now Levy just has a big window to resolve Sarkhan, the Dragon Speaker, ratcheting up that clock even further. And that's, that's certainly an option. He has got a Mardu Charm in hand as well, though, so he could just kind of try and reinforce the lock that he's got at present by saying, I'm going to control more about what's in your hand while beating you up a little bit. I mean, the thing about deploying Sarkin is you've got to worry about Perilous Fault, but if you look at the clock, you're attacking for nine points of damage this turn. That means that you're going to have Cuneo dead before he can even activate Perilous Fault. So I think you've got to just go for Sarkin here. Now, it's, it's interesting to me the way that a control has evolved. We don't have a four-mana way of uh, a Wrath of God effect, if you will, a Day of Judgment. Um, now that those effects t typically cost five in the format, we see quite a different line of attack from a lot of the aggro decks. They, they can kind of they can play a different game and say they can go, go underneath the mass removal. And they're talking about life tools now, but it, it, Tim, you're absolutely right. That means that you don't have to prioritize one drops, uh, you know, one mana, two power creatures, for example, as a way of going in under a card like Supreme Verdict. Sure. You have a little bit more time and can play these higher impact two and three mana creatures. And of course, a card like Sarkin, great against in hostilities anyway, because the fact that it's a Planeswalker means it gets to sit right on the board and attack the turn after your opponent would cast a mass removal spell. So Andrew Cunio here hitting lands, which is normally what you want to do with control, but you kind of want to do a little bit more than that, and he's not really achieving too much in that regard whatsoever. So Raph Levy here draws a card for the turn, and he doesn't really need to do a whole lot more, but it looks like there might be a Mardu Charm just to make sure that the way is clear for what could be a match-winning attack. And I think that's exactly what he's doing. I mean, you're talking about transformational boards here. Wow, yeah, and, and that's going to be the game. That is exactly what Levy did bringing in Brimaz, King of Erexos, uh, as basically his only creature uh, against Cuneo's plan, which is great at dealing with Planeswalkers, not so much with three mana, three fours. Yes. So it, it feels to me like the big story of this round, back in the booth here, I'm Tim Willoughby, here with Zach Hill, is about sideboarding. And I don't think this is unusual necessarily to what we saw in the feature match area just now. This seems like standard as we know it right now. The game one, there was one thing going on in terms of what was happening, certainly in the back, the back table with Sean McLaren and Lee Shi Qian. Game two, quite a different plan altogether. And then the nuances of sideboarding between... Um, between Andrew Cunha and Raph Levy, also very, very important in how that match went. Yeah, I mean, we saw in game two, Levy just holding on to a bunch of burn spells and removal spells didn't really accomplish anything. Cunio devastating him with those uh, ban with those uh, disdainful strokes, but the disdainful strokes proved to be a liability against Brimaz. I mean, we saw Sarkin get a window in to do some damage, but that was because of Mardu Charm taking Dissolve. That really was all about Brimaz hitting the table and just taking over the game by itself. Yeah, a little spot adjustments there from Levy, ultimately able to win the match in three. But it sounds like we might be able to find out a little bit more from the man himself, because down on the floor, we have Marshall Sutcliffe ready to speak to the Hall of Famer, Raphael Levy, and tell us a little bit more about how that match went from the French side of the right, table. Hey guys, welcome down to the Future Match Area. Marshall Sutcliffe here, and I've got Raphael Levy with me. Raph, congrats, nice victory there. So where does that put you for the tournament right now? Uh, I think it's 8-3. Eight, 8-3, three. Eight, three, yeah. 
Not too bad, looking decent here, but you've got to have a really strong finish to get to where you want to go. How are you feeling about that with your standard deck? I, uh, it took me a while to know how to play this deck because I switched like two days before the PT. I was testing this uh, very sweet mono red deck. It was, I was heartbroken to leave it, to leave it because it, not, was it not good enough. It took me a while to get to know how to play this deck and it feels sweet now. So uh, hopefully I can go all the way. What would you say are the deck's biggest strengths? It's, uh, it's very hard to actually beat because, you know, you have so many ways to... Uh, it's, you, you're going to play a grinding game, but with Chandra, you're going to be, like, behind all the time. So that's why you're going to lose. Mm. Now, I noticed that in one of your games here, you actually ultimated Sarkhan, and you were drawing, like, three cards a turn and kind of going off. How many times have you done that, and how good is it when you get that emblem? It's the first time I actually do it myself. I played against it. And I lost. Uh, like at, the, at that time, I could attack either attack. He was on 12. I could have attacked and kill him in three turns. But it was kind of risky because he could have played either spout or hero's downfall. And uh, drawing three cards a turn is probably gonna win me the game. So uh, it actually did. So uh, it was pretty sweet. Yeah, I noticed. I, it looked like he just couldn't overcome the type of card advantage that you were getting. Even though you have that, you have to use them up by the end of your turn clause, it didn't seem to matter. Like, it's uh, almost a threat every turn. And even if you had the 6-7 Serpent guy, I don't know, I don't know, Pearl Lake Ancient. Per yeah, that's it. Yeah, Pearl Lake Ancient. <laughs> like, I could pretty much deal with it every turn. At, at some point when he didn't have, we couldn't cast it again. Like, he was, he was so much behind with only lands in hand. He couldn't cast it. Like, it was, it was over. Now, is there a matchup that you would prefer not to see when you sit down? Uh, you know, you've got a pretty decent feel for the type of decks that are floating around out in the field now. I think that was probably one of the worst matchups. So uh, I've been playing a lot of Mardu Control Mirror. Like the first, the first game, they usually play aggro. Mm -hmm. So it's a very good game one. And then they turn into this even more controlled Mardu. And that's get much harder. So probably that's the match I would like not to play. What about Mardu Charm? I noticed that you were kind of picking apart Kunio's hand with it. The card seems really great right now. That's the reason why we play the deck, because it does, it does everything. It's a removal, it's good against control, it's good against like weenies, just, like two one ones first strike. It's just a blowout when they attack with their team. That does seem like one of the better cards. And then, of course, you get other great things like Sarkon and cards that we've seen in other decks that have been doing well. Uh, what about for Limited for you? How did that go? I went 5-1. Oh, so actually quite well. Did you get a lot of drafts in before you came in? Not enough, but I'm very happy with the 5-1 draft. My first draft was sweet, 2-1, that was, okay, my second, my second draft was awesome. And like, I, I would not have been disappointed with not a 3-0. So with seven or eight drafts in, oh, yes. I'm very happy with the 5-1. All right, well, Raf, thanks for the time and good luck in the rest of the tournament. We'll send it back to the booth. Thank you, Marshall. There we see Raf Levy, very pleased with how he's doing. He's, he's one of those players that, he, it's very obvious how he feels about how he's doing in this tournament <laughs> at any given moment. If he's doing well, you, you, you could see there how pumped up he was. Um, at the start of the day, he was sort of thinking, well, I need to have a good day today if I'm really going to make something happen. But I think he's basically just been rattling off wins the whole day so far today. If he can continue, he could still make top eight. But this is the end of our, um, the end of our round here, round 12 here at Pro Tour Khans of Tarkir. So... Well, we've got four more rounds to go. There's not that much more that needs to be done for the people that want to make it into the, uh, the top eight. And if they can do it, there's an awful lot to be played for. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just eager to see more matches of standard. I mean, every single time we go to the feature match, it looks like a different deck, a different archetype, and even the same styles of decks. I mean, we've seen three totally different blue-black control decks. We've seen several different types of Obzon, ranging from aggro to mid-range of control. We heard Levy talk about how after sideboard, some of the decks change completely between game one and game two. We saw that from Brad Nelson's Red White. I mean, we've seen it from a lot of different decks. So, you know, I really believe this is one of the most interesting standard formats that I can remember. I'm looking forward to watching four more rounds of it. Oh, it's interesting. It's challenging. Uh, there's a lot for us still to learn. But then there's a lot of rounds still to watch. So <laughs> we'll be back to you very soon with round 13 here at Pro Tour Khans of Tarkir. But in the meantime, let's go and see what's going on in the booth with Rich. All right. Thanks so much to Tim and Zach down there for the floor. First round of standard is done. Four rounds still to go. Rich Hagen here with Randy Bude. Wait, 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 wait. You are meant to be doing a deck tech, it says here. Why are you sitting beside me at the desk? 
I got a problem with this deck tech. Okay, is it something I can <laughs> help you with? And is it something I can help you with on air? I don't know what the deck should be called. Right. It, so this Just Guy deck has been kicking ass all weekend long. Uh -huh. It's got flyers, it's got awesome creatures, it's got burns. Is it a tempo deck? That's what people were calling it before we got here. Okay. We've been calling it Just Guy Aggro, but then I watch it on camera and it's winning with dig through time and winning the late game. And it's got the ability to turn transform itself into a control deck. It's not it's not really an aggro deck. Okay. It's not really a tempo deck. Okay. It's is it is it not a control deck? No. Uh, I mean it can it can shift between all the roles. That's one of the things that makes the deck so cool. Doesn't that make it mid-range? Or some, not no? only sometimes. Oh. Right. It's like a zoo deck, like the old decks that would play like Kurt Apes and Burn Spells or Nakatles and you kind of get your, your Mantis Rider as your Goblin Guide and your it's a zoo deck. So we just, just guys call it Jeskai Aggro Combo Zoo Midrange. No? I guess, I mean, maybe it's like Jund where it's just like, it's just Jeskai. Uh, okay. I don't know what to call the deck. Uh, all right. I can't I, do I, the deck I, deck. Uh, Randy, Randy, I don't know. Randy, Randy, it's fine. I got this. You got this? Yeah. Well, I haven't. They've got this. Nate Price, MTG Community Manager, to the rescue. Here's what we're going to do. You go away. You go over there. I got to do my deck you, tech? You go over there. You all get right. ready for your deck tech. Here's what we'll do. You all at home, watch the deck tech with Randy and BDM. This is a Jess guy deck. If you go to bit.ly, 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 forward slash Jess guy, the clan, J-E-S-K-A-I, there will be a poll there from Nate Price. He will give you a bunch of options for what this deck should be called. And just so you know, whatever you decide will be forever more associated with this deck archetype. bit.ly forward slash Jeskai. So right now, to bring you the who knows what it's called Jeskai deck, here's Randy Bueller and first, Brian David Marshall.